Well, good morning. Welcome to the Church of the Apostles. So glad you've uh, come to join us in worship this morning as we gather as a family of believers to worship Jesus Christ. And so welcome on this glorious day. Uh, if you are new with us this morning, there is a connection card in the Bible in front of you. You're welcome to fill that out, and that's a way to get to, uh, to know what's going on at the church or to get connected with the church. Or if you have any questions, then we'll reach out to you and uh, just welcome you. Uh, that way, if you have any prayer requests, then you can write your prayer requests on the back of that as well. Uh, but we're so glad that you are here this morning as we've gathered to worship Jesus and everything that we say and everything that we do, that our posture and our heart will be that Jesus is in the center of it all. And as a call to worship this morning, I'd like to read the song in Isaiah 26. Uh, it says, in that, that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. It says, we have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep me in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock, for he has humbled the inhabitants of the height, the lofty city. He lays it low, lays it low to the ground, casts it to the dust. The foot tramples it, the feet of the poor, the, the steps of the needy. The path of the righteous is level. You make level the way of the righteous. In the path of your judgment, O Lord, we wait for you. Your name and remembrance are the desire of our soul. Let us pray. God, thank you so much for this beautiful song that reminds us that you are the everlasting rock, the rock of ages, the one that has always been and will always be. Thank you for your steadfast love and grace and mercy. Lord, we are humbled that we get to sit in your presence and call out on the name of Jesus Christ to guide our time. The Holy Spirit will guide our hearts. Thank you for the power of your word as it rains over us today, or that it would be a balm to our souls. We love you, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing Rock of Ages this morning. Rock of Ages cleft for me, let me hide myself. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill the lost commands. Should my passion never fade and my efforts all be weighed, all for sin could not atone. You must save and you alone. Rock of
our strength and song. Highest praise to Him belongs. Christ the Lord, the conquering King. Your name we raise, your triumph sing. Praise the Lord, our mighty Lord. Praise the Lord, the glorious One. By His hand we stand in victory. By His name we overcome. And though the storms of hell pursue, in darkest night we worship
flesh may fail the earth below give way my eyes my eyes I'll see the Lord lifted high upon that day behold the Lamb that was slain and I know every tear was worth it all though you say me yet I will praise you though you take Scripture reading this morning will be found in the book of Daniel. As we continue through Daniel, we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 5. And so our scripture reading this morning is going to be the whole of Daniel chapter 5. You can find that on page 932 if you want to follow along in the Bibles that are there in front of you in the seats. And as you're finding your way there, uh, those Bibles in the pews are for you to use, but also to take with you. If you need a Bible, or you know someone that needs a Bible, please take that with you. That's our gift to you. We'd love for you to take and use that or share that with someone that may need it. And so Daniel chapter 5 this morning, beginning in verse 1. King Belshazzar made a great feast for thousands of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that they had taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank them. And they drank wine, and they praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. The king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. But the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. 
In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show you the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretations. But they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck, and you shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. But nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness he gave him, all peoples, nations, and language trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive, and whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of the heaven, until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven." And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and his writing, this writing was inscribed, And this is the writing that was inscribed, Mena, Mena, Tekel, and Parson. And this is the interpretation of the matter. Mena, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and been found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck. And a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. This is the word of the Lord. If you would pray with me, and then we're going to look at that chapter together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what it teaches us, uh, for what it shows us about who you are what it reminds us about what is reality and what is true. And uh, we thank you that your word is truth, that you have kept it. We pray that as we spend time in it today, that you would be the one who leads and teaches and guides us. We pray that the Holy Spirit would take the eternal truth of your word and, and, and make it real to us, that you would show us how it applies to us and our lives. I pray that we would see so clearly your glory and your holiness what that means for us, but also that we would see clearly what Jesus has done for us. And so we just pray that you would be glorified in everything that is done and said here tomorrow, uh, this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, If you know me at all, uh, you know that I I love music. I listen to music a lot. Uh, I often write sermons listening. uh, I listen to music without words when I write sermons because otherwise that doesn't work. But I listen to music kind of all the time. And so what ends up happening is, uh, you know, I fall in love with like different albums or different kind of pieces at different times. And it kind of becomes the soundtrack of your life because your memories get tied with songs and you remember things in those ways. And so I I was listening uh, to an album I hadn't listened to in a long time. 
uh, this week, and it brought up all these memories, uh, and, and suddenly I remembered very vividly that Joanna and I had listened to this in the hospital when she was pregnant with Asher. And so suddenly all these memories come flooding back, but the songs that really stick with me or the things that really kind of get ingrained are not only the ones that have the memories tied to it, but they also have some profound truth in it. And those, those words kind of get lodged in your mind, and it's not just melodies and what you like, but also the truth of what's being said. And so there was a song that I was listening to this week, and it, and it sparked a lot of what we're going to look at today here in Daniel chapter 5, but there was um, this idea in this particular song, and it just says, You swear that there's no truth, and who cares? How come you say it like you're right? And it's from a song that came out 15 years ago, and I listened to a bunch of times. And and there's a very profound truth just in that one statement. And I remember going back to that and thinking about it a lot through the years whenever I heard that song, that this idea that if we say there's no truth, uh, that we're here by random accident, what our culture says at large in in a lot of ways, that we kind of Uh, ended up here, there's no creator, there's no God, we ended up here by random accident, then how do you manufacture meaning? Uh, How do you have convictions about what is right and what is true and what is good and where do they come from? And so that song's kind of posing that question. You swear there's no truth and who cares? How come you say it like you're right? There's a contradiction there. And I was thinking about that because I was reading through, uh, rereading through a book that uh, Tim Keller wrote uh, this week called Making Sense of God. And in this book, he fleshes out this problem. He talks about how a relativistic society that doesn't point to any moral absolutes can then arrive at things that we think are moral and that we hold to with great conviction. And so in his book, he talks about it this way. He says, uh, sociologist Christian Smith found that younger Americans held two views of morality in sharp tension, even contradiction. Most are relativistic, not believing in any abiding moral absolutes, and yet they have many very strong moral convictions which they insist others should honor. But when asked how they knew if an action was moral or not, most said that they automatically know what is right or wrong in any situation. But when asked how they would explain to someone else why they should do or not do some action, they repeatedly insisted that everyone already knows what is right or wrong. You know, well, that's kind of a problem, is it not? If we don't have a way to point to why it's right and wrong, then how do you impose that on other people? But yet, largely in our society, people will say, yes, there are things that are right and wrong that we should hold to. And so there's a lot to consider in that, but I want you just to think about that for a second. How do we account for morality in the world? Why is it that as a society that there's lots of things that we say, no, that is absolutely wrong? And we would say that we would hold others to that. And so part of the question becomes that if you live in a relativistic society, you believe what you want to believe, and I'll believe what I want to believe, and it doesn't matter, and we can all just hold our own things, where do those absolutes come from? And you have a hard question of how do you answer that? How do you answer the question of why? For example, we might say uh, to our children that they should tell the truth and they should be kind and they should treat all people equally. But then how do you answer the question when they say, well, why? Why should I be kind and why should I tell the truth and why should I treat all people equally? And if we live in a relativistic society where we have no absolutes, it becomes very difficult to answer that question. And so I want you just to think about where that comes from. Now, as Christians, we believe it comes from God, that God is the creator of all things. He is the stainer of all things. He has made the world the way it is uh, in His great wisdom. He's created us in His image to know Him and to reflect Him, to love others in the way that He has loved us. And the Bible tells us there are things that are innately in us because we are made in God's image that we know are right and wrong. And so the person who's the relativist that just says, well, I just know, there's some truth to that statement. Because they are made in God's image, they just know that there are some things that are right and wrong. And the Bible tells us that very clearly. And so when we think about all those things, there's a lot that kind of comes in with that. How do we uh, wrestle with those things? How do we see that? How do we point back to what the Bible says? And if that's true, that there are some things that we just innately know, what does that mean for us in terms of culpability and our guilt? If there's things that we know absolutely, and yet we go against our conscience and we cross those things and we do them anyway, then that makes us guilty. 
And so there's a whole lot to all of that about morality and guilt and then judgment that comes. And I say that and I start there this morning because I think all of these ideas kind of get fleshed out in our text in Daniel chapter 5 today. And so what we've been doing is we've been walking through the book of Daniel. We're now up to chapter 5. It's stories that happened to Daniel and his friends in the Babylonian Empire, about 600 BC. Where we are today is almost 539 BC now. We're, We're jumping ahead in the timeline. But we've been looking at what it looks like to live in a society that doesn't have anything to do with God, that denies his existence and goes against all these things, and how to remain faithful. And so last week, we talked about how God humbles the king Nebuchadnezzar. And we saw Nebuchadnezzar in the first four chapters, In the fourth chapter, he's humbled greatly and he ends up praising God and and, and magnifying who God is and saying uh, what God has shown him. And so last week, what we talked about a lot was humility and pride and being humbled. Today in chapter five, it's kind of like the flip side of the coin of chapter four. Chapter four, we see Nebuchadnezzar being humbled and he is humbled and he comes to this place of recognizing who God is. Chapter five, we're gonna see God speak directly to the king that comes after him, Belshazzar, and it's kind of the opposite. God's judgment comes on Belshazzar, and he doesn't profess God, or he's not humbled in the same way. He doesn't come to that understanding, but God's judgment comes. And so I want us to look at the story of Belshazzar, and as we do, there's three things that I want us to see that are true of Belshazzar in this story, but they're also true of us. It's not just him, and I said this last week, and I'll say it again. When we read these stories, don't look at it as this story about Belshazzar and how bad he was and the way he ignored God and the way he rebelled and his arrogance and go, oh, look at how bad that guy was. But let it be a mirror that shows us our own hearts. What is God teaching us in this about who he is and who we are and how we relate to him? And so as we look at these things that are true of Belshazzar and true of us, we're going to see first that we are all without excuse before God. Secondly, we're going to see as such, we will all be rightfully judged. And then lastly, I want us just to think about what that judgment will look like. Right? So all of us are without excuse before God. Secondly, we will all rightfully be judged. And then lastly, what happens in that judgment? And so let's just start with the first one, that we are without excuse. Uh, this story here, we see King Belshazzar has now taken over. He has succeeded um, Nebuchadnezzar. He is now king. In our timeline in Daniel, the first three chapters, we talked about Daniel being very young, teenager. Chapter four, we don't know exactly how old he is, but he has, it's moved us ahead quite a bit. We have some dates attached to this chapter because of what's happening in the kingdom and different things. And so what we have is Daniel is about 80 years old now. And so we've jumped way ahead from his time as a teenager in those first three chapters to now he's an old man that has lived in Babylon for a long time, his lifetime. And he's been faithful to God and he's been uh, trusting God. Uh, We see that in the fact that they call him in and they want his wisdom in this situation. But in this story, what we have is Belshazzar is the new king that comes after Nebuchadnezzar. And it tells us in the middle of the chapter that he saw what God did with Nebuchadnezzar. He actually saw the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar in his life. He saw how God was working and what he showed Nebuchadnezzar and how that came together. But yet he ignored all of it. And just like Nebuchadnezzar before him, he's incredibly arrogant and he's incredibly proud and he puts all his kind of hope and trust and faith in himself and his understanding and his own belief. And I say belief very purposely because no matter what your convictions are or how you operate or how, what you think about the world, we all have faith-based assumptions, every single one of us. There is no person that's completely uh, objective in everything that they just look at the facts and they see that. I hear people say that regularly today. Well, I am a person of science and I only operate on what science says until you get to the place where science can't explain things. (laughs) And there's a whole lot of those. (laughs) And so what happens is we then make faith-based assumptions based on our understanding of science and the world and the things around us, but we all have faith-based beliefs. We all have put our belief ultimately in something. And so King Belshazzar has done that, and it actually tells us what he's put his faith in. If you see there in verse 3 and 4, he's having this huge party, and they're getting together, and they're drinking wine, and they're celebrating. Verse 3 says, they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God of Jerusalem, and the kings and his lords and wives and concubines drank from them. 
and they drank wine, and they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. Well, we could say in our language today, he's a naturalist. He believes that what is in the world is all there is. He's praising the God of, of gold and stone and silver, the things that we can touch and see, and this is all there is, and this is what he's praising and saying. This is what the world is about. And he says, bring in the things that we got out of the temple of the God of Israel. And he begins to mock, and we're going to drink out of these. And as we're drinking from these things that were used in worship in God's temple, we're going to worship the creation rather than the creator. And that's what they do. And that's exactly what's happening in this scene. And right about this time, as he decides to mock God, all of a sudden, a hand appears and begins to write on the wall in the banquet hall. And it's very famous, you've probably heard this story, it's where we get the, the uh, phrase, the handwriting on the wall, that all of a sudden this ominous thing, this hand appears and starts writing on the wall, and it tells us it scares Belshazzar to death. It scares him. Verse 6 it says that his color went from him, the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his limbs gave way, and his feet knocked together, or his knees knocked together. And suddenly he's freaking out, and he's scared, for good reason, I would say, I mean, if you're just professing that your faith is in the things that you can see and touch and feel, and all of a sudden this hand appears and writes on the wall, you've now got something that's far outside of your understanding of things, and it scares them to death. And so what does he do? He calls in the religious leaders. He calls in the guys that make sense of these things immediately. Get me the sorcerers and the magicians and the enchanters and bring them all in. And it's interesting that when Push comes to shove, and he's struggling with what's happening here. Immediately, he goes, call in the religious guys. I would like to now hear from them, right? And so, that's what he does. It's kind of like the old, there's, there's no atheist in the foxhole. Uh, there's no atheist when the hand starts writing on the wall, and you go, where is that coming from? And so, he calls them all in, and of course, like what we've seen so far in the book, they can't make sense of it. They're struggling to tell him what it means. And so finally, they call in Daniel. They remember that there's a guy that Nebuchadnezzar used to go to, this guy Daniel, who again is now 80. He's been here for a long time. And they call him in. And he comes in and he comes before Belshazzar and he says, you know who God is. Your uh, successor, the one that came before you, Nebuchadnezzar, was greatly humbled by God and you saw it all happen. He tells him that in verses 18 through 21. You saw what happened with Nebuchadnezzar, and you were right there, and you had a front row seat to it, and you saw exactly what God did, and you ignored it. And then he says in verse 22 and 23, Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Right? He says, you have decided to worship the creation rather than the creator. You've worshipped things that can't do anything for you, and the one that holds your breath in his hand, you have decided not to honor. And so what Daniel says to him is, you saw what God did with Nebuchadnezzar. You were there. You know what happened. You ignored all of it. And he says, so you are without excuse. It's really what he says to him. You have nowhere to run or hide here. You've kind of made your bed, and now you get to lie in it. This is what you've put your faith in. And so he calls him to task on that and tells him very quickly what's happening. But here's the part where I want us to stop and just consider a second that this is a mirror to our own hearts, not just that we go, yeah, this guy was really bad or he was really arrogant. Because the truth is we all do the same thing. We all ignore God regularly in the world he created. That's what sin is. We hear the things that God tells us. Our conscience bears witness the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. All of this is in Romans chapter 1, it's what Paul says. And he says all that and he brings it in chapter 1, I think verse 20, and he says, so you are without excuse. We too, just like Nebuchadnezzar, or Belshazzar here and Nebuchadnezzar before him, are without excuse. That we see who God is and we see how he's moving and we see how he's working and yet we rebel and we ignore God and the world he created. 
And so the first thing that Daniel tells him is you have no excuse. You saw all this. And I would say to you that the Bible tells us the same thing of all of us. We are without excuse. That God's presence is known through all these ways in which he's revealed to us most clearly in his word and in his son, Jesus. And so often we ignore God and the world he's created. And so the first part is there, just as he is without excuse, so are we. So when you realize that you're without excuse and you know it, then what? Well, back up just a second. Here he is having the big party, praising his gods of gold and silver and bronze and worshiping the creation, and he sees the handwriting on the wall, right? You know what that means. You know, from our, our culture today, you see the handwriting on the wall, that means it's not good. And in that moment when he's professing his faith in that just the things of the world is all there is, and he sees that hand, he goes, oh no, there's more to this than what I'm saying there is. And he knows it in that moment. And you know what that's like when you have a a guilty conscience and something starts to get kind of pulled up. I I remember very vividly being in elementary school, and every so often I would get home and my mom would meet me at the door and she'd say, do you have something to tell me? And I would rack my brain going, what does she know? And how does she know it? And I would think, like, did they call her? Did I get in trouble today? You know, some days you'd be like, no, I got nothing. And you're walking off thinking, I really don't have anything. But there were days that she would say that and you'd go, oh no, they called her, right? You got sent to the principal's office or you did something stupid or you what? And all of a sudden she asks and you know, and your color leaves you and your knees knock together and you're right, the handwriting on the wall, you go, oh no. And that's exactly what has happened here. And he's freaking out about the truth that he recognizes that he's guilty and that there is something more. But the queen comes in in verse 10, and she goes, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. We, I know a guy. It'll all be all right. And so in verse 10 and 11, the queen comes in and goes, no, 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 king, live forever. Let your color come back. It's okay. There's this guy, Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar used to use him, and he'll smooth things over. He knows God, and he knows what's up, and he'll, we'll bring him in. And so they call Daniel, and they bring him in. And I'll tell you, it's kind of what we do, isn't it? We kind of, I know a guy that's good with God. It's like relationship with God by proxy. I don't know if you've ever dealt with this. I, I deal with it all the time. People say, well, what do you do? And you meet somebody and you go, well, I'm a pastor. And this, I hear this 75% of the time. My uncle was a pastor. And you're like, oh, great. I worked at a, a Christian camp when I was in high school okay, good. (laughs) You know, like they start giving you their spiritual resume. Here's all the things that happened in my life that kind of says that I believe in God. And you go, okay, like, and we do that at different times. We start to try to grasp onto anything. And that's what the queen's doing here. Let's call Daniel in and let's get him in here. He'll help us out. But when Daniel shows up, it, it doesn't work out the way she hoped. Right? She says, let your, let your color come back and O king live forever. And Daniel shows up and he says, you don't have an excuse. You've seen God up close and you've seen what he was doing and you've seen how he's working and you don't have an excuse. And so he tells him all that and then he says, I'll tell you what the handwriting on the wall says. And so verse 25, he says, then from the presence, his presence, talking about God, the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed. And the writing was inscribed, Mena, Mena, Tekel, and Parson, in the interpretation of the matter. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Perish, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Not good news, Belshazzar. Your time is up. This is it. You have been weighed in the balance and you have been found wanting and you're about to lose everything. And so it's not like, hey, we got a guy that will fix it. We got a guy that comes in and tells you you don't have an excuse and this is the judgment. And so it's going to come. And that's what he tells him. And that's where he leaves Belshazzar. So I was thinking about what he says to him. I was reading in my own reading this week, just my own Bible reading plan. I was in the, the Gospel of Luke in Luke chapter 21, and it just struck me. I think I read it on Tuesday as I was working on this. And I love when God kind of taps you on the shoulder and goes, hey, this is exactly like this. (laughs) 
Can you see these two? And so Luke chapter 21, Jesus is talking about when the Son of Man returns, when he returns, when Jesus comes back. And he starts to talk about the signs of the time and what it will look like. And I read that and thought, man, that sounds like today. Distress of nations, people fainting with fear, natural disasters. When you see all these things, the Son of Man will appear. That's what Jesus says. But then this is what he says. In light of the fact that I am coming, and this is the signs that you look for, and this is when you know that my time is near, he says, watch yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape the things that are going to take place and stand before the Son of Man. And so what Jesus says is don't get sucked into Babylon. Don't be overtaken with the cares of the world. Right? That where he says there, uh, don't be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of life. He says, don't be hung over when I come back, but be alert and be awake and it can come at any time. And I read that and I thought, man, this is exactly what happened to Belshazzar. He's literally having a giant party where he's getting drunk with his buddies, mocking God, and all of a sudden the handwriting on the wall comes. And Jesus says the same thing. Don't get swept away with the times because I am coming back. And he says, I'm coming back, and you're going to stand before me. And that's what he says. And so the first part is we are without excuse. But the second part, just as it happens here with Belshazzar, it's going to happen with us. We are going to stand before God and give account. And Jesus says, so be seeking me in everything you're doing as it leads to that day. So the last part then is what happens in judgment. Well, for Belshazzar, it wasn't good. You have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Verse 30, it says, That very night Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. And so he's gone. And everything that he was putting his faith and trust in, the gods of gold and silver and stone, and he's having this giant party, and now it's gone, just like that. And now he's going to stand before God. This is what the Bible says that's going to happen. So what happens in judgment? that God is going to have us come and we're going to stand before him in his perfect righteousness, in his perfect holiness, and we're going to stand before the God of the universe and you're going to be weighed in the balance, right? Do you know what that means when they say that, right? The old school, the way that they, they bartered and they had money and they would put things on the scale and they'd weigh them to see if they were what they actually were. But the problem is we use that kind of language or we say that And I want us to be very clear because our culture gets this all jacked up. If you watch Christian movies, I shouldn't even say Christian movies, religious movies, you watch television shows with heaven and different things that go on, and what it is always is presented is like you're going to be weighed in the balance and your good works are going to be over here and your bad works are going to be over here. And if the good outweighs the bad, then you get to come in. In our culture, you'll see that without a doubt and everything. That's what it looks like. And so you're going to stand before God, and He's going to look at you, and He's going to see all your works and go, oh, are they good enough? That doesn't understand who God is. It doesn't work like that. God is holy and righteous, and He is perfect in every way. And the only way that you can stand in His presence is if your sin is completely removed, that there is no sin. The only way they could balance out is if there's no sin and you're perfect in every way to be in His presence, to be united with Him in the fullness of what you were created for. And the truth is, none of us could ever do that. It's important for us to understand that if we, like Belshazzar, put our trust in the gods of gold and silver and our understanding in the world and what we've accomplished, we're going to stand before God and we're going to recognize before a holy, righteous God that will never, ever measure up. And so there's really only two choices when we talk about judgment and what will happen and what it will look like. You will either stand before God trusting in yourself and your works. And if that's the case, the Bible tells you what happens. In Revelation chapter 20, it says that you'll stand before Him and He's going to open the book of life and everything that you ever said 
or ever did or ever thought, every intention of your heart will be brought into the clear. What was done in the darkness will now be brought out into the light, and you will see all of it laid out perfectly and completely before you, and you will see the holiness of God. And if you seek to stand on your merit, you will be weighed in the balance and found wanting. And God will say you are guilty. Jesus says he will look at you and say, depart from me, I never knew you. And you will be banished from his existence for eternity into the wrath of God, the perfect, righteous anger of God against all that is sinned. And the Bible is so clear on this point that Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you, because you don't know who God is if you think you can approach him based on what you do, because you can never do enough. I I think of Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah sees the throne room of God, and he immediately falls down and says, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips. He knows immediately. And that's what will happen if you seek to stand before God in your own doing. But the second option is you stand before God, transferring your trust from yourself and the things of the world and your doing to Jesus and what He has done for you. Because what you could never do for yourself, Jesus comes and says, I will do it for you. That's why Jesus came. He came to take your sin and to die the death that you deserve, to bear the weight of the wrath of God on your behalf because of all the times that you've ignored Him, because of all the things that you knew were right and yet you didn't do. Every single one of them Jesus deals with. And so when you transfer your trust to Him, He says, I will take your sin and I will give you my righteousness. And you know what the Bible then says? Is that you will stand before Him and he will open the book, and he will look, and there will be no sin, because you are in him. Look at it, and as it tells us so clearly in Hebrews, and in Micah, and in Isaiah, your sins will be as far as the east is from the west, you will be white as snow, and it's all because of what Jesus has done, and you will know in that moment that you are desperately sinful and wicked, but that Jesus is gloriously gracious, and that he loves you, And then he's got you, and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And you're going to go, how? How can you be so loving? How can you be so merciful? How can you be so good? And then this amazing thing happens that I still don't understand. He's going to look at all the things that you did from faith, which is really just the Holy Spirit working in you for any of it to be good, and then He's going to reward you for it. He's going to give you rewards for things that you did, for trusting Him that was all Him. You're going to go, what? I really believe you're going to turn around and that's just going to be fuel for your worship, to worship the glory of this gracious God that has done for you what you could never, ever do for yourself, and you will know it in fullness. And when he says, enter into the fullness of my joy, you'll go, yes. <laughs> and it'll be so clear it's all God's doing. And I tell you, the Bible is clear on this, and that's the only two options. It's either you're trusting yourself or you're trusting in what God has done for you in Jesus, and that's it. And so, as we end today, I would just say this to you. If you think about the idea of dying and standing before God and you go, I don't know, then you're trusting yourself. If you go, yes, I'm going to rest in the goodness of Jesus and I can't wait to see Him, then we've transferred our trust to Jesus. And if you're not sure, we want to talk to you about what that means, what it means to follow Jesus, to love Him, to make Him the center of your life, because that is where your joy will be found, it's where your rest will be found. It's where the grace of God floods into your life and gives you peace in all circumstances because of what He's done for us. So God is good and He loves you. Be reconciled to Him 
and what Jesus has done for you. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the glorious truth of your word, that you love us, that you have done for us what we could never, ever do for ourselves. I pray that if there are those here today that recognize in their conscience and your word and what you've shown us, that they've fallen short, which is all of us, but are struggling to find the forgiveness that only comes in you, would you soften their hearts to show them so clearly what Jesus has done for us, that we would be able to rest in his love and his mercy and the peace that only comes from him. Help us to see that afresh today. I pray that we'd leave here resting in the goodness of what you have done for us in Jesus, that we'd want to tell others, we'd want to spend time pointing people to you, pray that you would help us with great energy and creativity to tell our children of your goodness, to tell our friends and our neighbors, to continue to point them to the glory of what you've done for us in Jesus. And we pray all of it in his precious name. Amen. This is the time in our service where we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. You'll find these cups there in your chair in front of you. And so if you're here today and you have put your trust in Jesus and you are clinging to him through faith alone, by grace alone, and what Christ has done for us alone, we invite you to take communion with us. If you're here today and you don't quite understand what that means and you're still struggling with what it means to follow Jesus, I would just ask you to read through the prayers that are printed in your bulletin. They're there to kind of guide your thoughts during this time. But for those that are going to take the Lord's Supper together today, We're being reminded in this visible form of what Jesus has done for us, that it's by his body and his blood that we have been reconciled to God, that he has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. So Jesus himself instituted this on the night before he would go to the cross and willingly lay his life down on our behalf. The scriptures record it this way, when the hour had come, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we get to celebrate what Jesus has done for us, that we are his and that we will see him and we will celebrate with him again in glory when we get to do this with him, when he does return. And so until that day, we continue to remind each other of who we are in Jesus. And so this is the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Stand with me as we continue to worship this morning. Lord, I... 
reminded um, today, this, this week, uh, Lord, that our, our lives are just a, a mist, Lord, a vapor, that we're not promised tomorrow, and that today we would be sons and daughters that would worship you in spite of the unknown, in spite of fears and anxieties and concerns, Lord, that we would worship you, that we would find our heart's desires to point others that you've placed in our lives, that you've trusted in relationships, you've given us equity with, that we point them to who you are as the King of Kings, and the only one that we can put our hope in. God, thank you for this beautiful reminder this morning. Thank you for your, your word. God, and as it empowers and it bolsters um, the call to be disciples that go and make disciples. And we know that we cannot do that without you, so we sing that song. Lord, we need you. We need you every moment, every thought, every word that we speak. We need you. We're desperate for you to guide us for your glory. Help us, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, I have a couple of announcements for us. Again, that connection card is there for you to fill out and get connected to uh, the church and uh, we sent out a weekly newsletter that will have a lot of these announcements in the, the newsletter that we sent out, but I wanted to make an important one. This is the last week uh, for our students that will be going for the summer camp, which is next summer, but we have to have uh, a, a head count by the end of this week. And so today is a great day for you to go out into the, uh, the foyer and fill out or put your name down. Um, we will be taking care of the deposits but we need to make sure that we have the proper amount of um, people to go with those deposits. And so uh, Andy asked me to make this s specific announcement is that if you are a fifth grader, if you have a student that's a fifth grader and going into sixth grade, then they too are available to go to the summer camp of next, next year. So if you uh, have any questions about that, uh, myself or Andy or someone will be by the, fellowship, or by the uh, welcome desk. You can ask us about that. Um, our deadline is the 15th of this week, so we need to make sure that we go ahead and get all those uh, names out there. 
Tomorrow morning, we'll have uh, our first ladies' Bible study. That'll start at 10 a.m. and go till noon. So ladies, you're welcome to come here to the church from 10 to 2. Uh, we'll begin the, the Bible study. If you can't make the Monday morning Bible study, which does have child care, then there will be also the exact same Bible study on Wednesday evening here at 630 so those two begin this week, this Monday, this Wednesday. Ladies, come out for the Bible study. We'll be going over um, Timothy and Titus and walking through those books together. So please plan on doing that if you're able to do that. Uh, men, we have our men's breakfast, which will be on the 18th. So next Saturday, we'll be meeting here together and uh, spend time in God's Word and fellowship. So uh, breakfast is provided. So I'd love for you to come out. That's at 8 a.m. this coming Saturday, the 18th. So please plan on hanging out with us for that. And then also we'd like to invite you on the 26th, which is two Sundays from now, to stick around afterwards, ladies, if you'd like to. There is a, uh, a baby shower for Tom and Mella. Mella, can you just wave at us? There's Mella. She, uh, she is going to have a baby. It's going to be awesome. Their first one. Uh, and so we're going to have a baby shower for her on um, the 26th after church. So uh, you're welcome to stick around and spend time with that. Ladies and I think guys are invited as well. So please plan on doing that. Please stand with me for the benediction. Jude, verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures.